It's love and a trace, meaning life did he give Each of my heart does, my Savior now live It's love and a trace Aloha everybody, welcome back to the channel We're in Studio One today, myself and my director Tara And we're so excited about today's message but before I get started, be sure and do a thumbs up. And if you are not yet a subscriber, please subscribe and hit the little bell so that you can know when Kona Faith Center is on TV. We have church on Sunday and Wednesday that is streamed live. If you live in the area, we want to welcome you to come and meet us personally. And if you live outside of Kona on the big island, we just want to say welcome to our Ohana even though you're far away. And we're so glad you're watching. You ready for today's message? I'm gonna be talking about certainty. It sure has been an uncertain world, hasn't it? Well, let's talk about some certainty because the reality is our certainty is only in the Lord. And I am gonna read a, a definition, and it's a short one, of what certainty is. It's a fixed or real state. It's a truth or a fact. Certainty of God and his word does not come from the faith of the believer, but it comes from the faithfulness and trustworthiness of God himself. It comes because of who God is. It doesn't come because of what we believe, what we see, what we know, what we confess. Those things are good if we're doing it in the spirit and if we're doing it through the word of God. But we have to be careful that we don't ever think that it's because of what we're doing, because that's legalism. It's That's works. That's not the relationship with God. That's not living the life that he has enabled us and empowered us to live by the Holy Spirit. All right, I'm going to start in Luke chapter 1, and I'm going to read verses 1 to 4, I believe. And I'm starting in the New King James Version today, and I have several different translations today. All right, and in Luke 1 and 1, it says, Insomuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which has been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things, from the very first, to write you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. What am I talking about? I'm talking about, it's kind of like Luke's, even though it's uh, scriptures, verses 1 through 4 in Luke 1, it's kind of his preamble of what he's going to be talking about in the rest of his book, in the rest of his pages that he penned by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he's letting Theophilus know this is what they had seen. They had been there. He had been there from the beginning. So he is letting them know that this is certain. I was there. I saw it. I lived it. I know it. So that's why I wanted to read that to you so that you know that when the Gospels were written, when the letters of the Apostles were written, the Old Testament, the New Testament, David's Psalms, uh, King Solomon's Ecclesiastes and his Proverbs and everything that was written from the five books at the beginning from Genesis through through Deuteronomy, I think, um, Mo, that Moses wrote. Just all of the authors that were penned by the Spirit. You have to understand these. Now, they weren't in a trance. They were just the Spirit of God was speaking to every single one. And the, and the Bible, the scripture has been gone over and over and over again to make sure that it is 100% accurate. So just want you to know that. And theologians check up on it often. And we're going to go from here. Are you ready? We're going to go to Job. We're going to go to Job chapter 19. And we're going to just read one verse. And that verse is 25. And this is Job speaking after his experience, after everything that went on. He says, for I know, I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand at last on the earth. This was before Jesus came in the flesh. And so Job 
knew this because of what he had been through, how God had delivered him, how God had explained things to him at the end of his ordeal, which God didn't put on him. We remember it was the enemy, enemy of our souls, that had to get permission to do this. And God said, okay, but you cannot kill him. You cannot kill him. And God blessed him abundantly. And Job just says, I know. I know that my Redeemer lives. He was certain. And he shall stand at last on the earth. Could be talking about the first coming of Jesus Christ or the second coming of Jesus Christ or both. He doesn't go into detail other than that. He just wanted to get across that he is certain about God. He is certain about Messiah. He is certain about the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God. Let's go to Joshua 23 and 15. And I am still reading from the New King James Version. Or the, Yes. Therefore it shall come to pass, this is verse 15, that as all, as all the good things have come upon you, which the Lord your God promised you, so the Lord will bring upon you all harmful things until he has destroyed you from this good land, which the Lord your God has given you. See, God gave blessings and cursings. And what he's talking about, that whether he promised the blessing because people chose him over the things of the world, or the cursing because people chose the world over him, over their creator, over the God that loves them. And many of us have been there and done that. And if you're in that situation now, you just need to call on the name of Jesus. That's calling repentance when you turn away from sin and you turn to Jesus. The Bible says he has forgiven it all. He remembers it no more. You need to get plugged into a good church. You need to get in your word and see what God does in your life. So you could say, I know that my Redeemer lives. Okay, let's go to Psalm 18 and 30. And I'm going to read this verse from the New American Standard Bible. As for God, his way is blameless. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. Anyone who's walked with the Lord for any length of time has seen the trying of the word that it is the truth. What God promises, what he has promised through the prophetic, which is still coming to pass, and a lot of it in our lifetime. He does what he says. He does what he says. It, you can be certain. You could go to the bank with God's word, and it will just draw you a hundredfold increase. I'll tell you what. Let's go to Hebrews 6 and 13 and 20 in the translation of God's word. We're so blessed to have so many translations in our lifetime, in our generation. Okay. God made a promise to Abraham. Since he had no one greater on whom to base his oath, he based it on himself. That's pretty amazing. He said, I will certainly bless you and give you many descendants. And we're living in that time of truth. We're living in the time since 1948 that Israel has returned as a nation after thousands of years. So Abraham, verse 15, received what God promised because he waited patiently. Aha, uh -huh. there's that word, that P word. You don't have to pray for it. It comes naturally that we'll have to wait patiently for things. That he waited patiently for it. When people take oaths, they base their oaths on someone greater than themselves. Their oaths guarantee what they say and end all arguments. When we take an oath with God, God is so much greater. God wouldn't change his plan. He wanted to make this perfectly clear to those who would receive his promise. God cannot lie. It's impossible for God to lie. Impossible. The devil is the author and finisher of all lies. That's all he can do. He can take the scripture and pervert them. He's a pervert. That's what he does. He perverts everything in this life from God's good to his evil, because he is 100% evil. That's why he got cast out of heaven, and that's why he is going to be spending eternity in the fiery furnace. 17. God wouldn't change his plan. 
He wanted to make this perfectly clear to those who would receive his promise, so he took an oath. God did this so that we would be encouraged. God cannot lie. When he takes an oath or makes a promise, these two things can never be changed. That is never, never, ever when God says it. And that's why, you know, when I read before about something about the people being cursed, if he promises that you live a certain way, his way, and we're not talking legalism, we're talking a relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's how God wants it. That's what Abraham set, had. That's what all these people had. And that's why the promise of Abraham is being fulfilled even in our day. So he can't lie when he takes an oath or makes a promise. It's impossible. These two things can never, never be changed. Those of us who have taken refuge in him hold on to the confidence we have been given. And this is great confidence. And it says it over and over and over. Verse 19, we have this confidence as a sure and strong anchor for our lives. You know, when a, a ship or a boat is anchored, it cannot leave where it's at. It is stuck there. And God is stuck on his word. And his promises are yes and amen. It says this confidence goes into the holy place behind the curtain where Jesus went before us on our behalf. You know, in the Old Testament days, only the high priest could go behind that curtain in the Holy of Holies once a year. And they had a thread around him or a string, actually a rope around his foot because if he was in there and a sinner, man, he got pulled out dead. But now the Bible is very clear we could go to his throne of grace and obtain mercy and grace any time we need. There no longer is that veil. That veil was torn when Jesus was crucified on that cross because it was finished. Our sin payment was finished. God is so good. He's just so good to us. Numbers 23 and 19, and I'm back in the New American Standard. God is not a man that he should lie nor a son of man, that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? This is a wonderful scripture, and we declare this, one of our intercessors declares this almost every time we get together for prayer before both our services on Sunday and Wednesday. He will make it good. He cannot lie. It's impossible. He can't. There's no lie in him. There's no untruth in our God because he is the author of truth and part of his DNA, just like his love, it is truth. And that can't change. It's who our God is. It, we can be certain that his promises are yes and amen. We can be certain that our God will not lie. Okay, let's go to verse 14 in Matthew 16. And they said, some say John the Baptist and others Elijah. But still others, Jer oh, I don't think I read the very first thing. I'm sorry, I'm going to go back to Matthew 16 and verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now, he knew the answer, but he wanted to hear what they said. And they said, some say John the Baptist and others Elijah, but still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, see, it was a setup, but it was a good setup. But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. I wrote in my Oha today, I, out of all the apostles, I just love Peter. He's my favorite. And I can't wait to meet him in the heavenly realm and tell him face to face. He was a guy who took risks. That was awesome. Who else walked on the water? He might have, you know, lost faith there, but Jesus was right there to carry him, but he took the risk. He trusted. And Jesus said to him in verse 17, Blessed are, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Who's Simon? That was Peter's name, but Jesus named him Peter because he said he was a rock. He was a rock, actually a small rock. When he says that upon this rock, he's talking about huge rock, 
that he would build his church. But he said, and Bar Jonah, Bar just meant son, and Jonah was son of Jonah. They, they didn't use last names. No, Christ or Messiah is not Jesus' last name. He would be Bar Joseph, okay? 18, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I am telling you, you don't have to be afraid of the devil. You just need to operate in the authority of Jesus Christ over him. He is not more powerful than God. In fact, the Bible says in the Old Testament that when we see God, we're going to think, wow, that was him. I mean, when, when we're with God and we see the enemy, that we're going to say, wow, that was him. There, he's nothing. He has no authority. One of the reasons that Jesus came and what he says is that he came to defeat the power and the purpose of the enemy. So praise God for that. We have authority in the name of Jesus. He's passed it on to us, his disciples. So he says in verse 18, I also say to you that you are Peter and upon this rock, that's the little rock if you look it up, I will build my church, that's the big rock, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. We bind the enemy from his works, he is bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. We loose people from the destruction, from the corruption, from the hold that the enemies had on them, and they are loosed in Jesus' name. Verse 20, then he warned the disciples that they shall not, they should not tell they should tell no one that he was the Christ. Why? Because it was just safety for him and for his disciples at that time. Let's go now to Hebrews 6, 9 through 12. And I'm back in the New American Standard Bible. And what it says in these verses is, But beloved, we are convinced, we are certain of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation Though we are speaking in this way, for God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown towards his name in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. God does not forget that. We are raising up gifts in heaven. It is awesome. Verse 10, for God is not unjust, this is certain. So as to forget your work and the love which you have shown towards his name in having ministered and still ministering to the saints. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. So that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. I'm going to stop here for today, and please join me next time for such a time as this on our teaching in Studio One. And don't forget, thumbs up, don't forget, subscribe, and Father, bless the people who have heard this so far, this message that you have given by the power of the Holy Spirit, that they hear your words, that they review your words, and that they know that what you promised to them, to each one of us, that your entire word is certain. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You alone, Lord, made me a brand new creation. It is only by your spirit could